um, you're very welcome along to the last in the series of All Under One Roof um, of 2020. And I can tell you, we're all, we're not going to, we to see the back of 2020, I just cannot wait. I'm sure we could all say the same. So my name is Claire Colley. I'm the Managing Director of uh, Claire Colley Estate Agent based in Dundrum. And um, I started a series uh, oh, about two or three months ago because so many of my clients find the property service can be confusing and that they overlap. So I really just wanted to help clients to identify the different services available and also to, to showcase our amazing uh, Irish business that we have here on the doorstep, such a wealth of talent. So I'm absolutely delighted this morning to introduce Johanna Lacey. Johanna is the principal solicitor of Johanna Lacey Solicitors, and she's based two offices based in Dublin and Kells. But as an estate agent, I suppose I'm particularly um, delighted to welcome you, Johanna, because so many of our, our clients, they find the process of conveyancing so long and so drawn out and so many issues. So, you know, and so confusing. So and I actually have to say I had the pleasure of um, dealing with Joanna, liaising with Joanna, just literally closing out two sales, one on Wednesday, in fact, and one today, the 18th. Fantastic. And I can tell you the whole process was so efficient and it wouldn't have been the same without Joanna. I really do. It was the easiest process, Joanna. Thank you for that. So maybe you might just start by giving us a little bit about your background and how you actually got into the legal area and what drew you to it. We'd all be delighted to hear it. Well, Claire, um, I, I think it was in my blood, really. Uh, my great grandfather set up the original family practice in Kells uh, in 1893. Um, wow. so I was really destined to end up here. And actually, uh, my grandfather and then my father uh, then continued on in Kells. Um, I actually moved down to Tipperary and set up on my own uh, over 10 years ago, but my brother now is at the helm in Kells. So it's lovely to see a generation keep going. So fourth generation there in Kells. Uh, and then we have the side, the, the, the side, uh, the side offices. My aunt is a solicitor in Blanchardstown. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm here. I, I, uh, I have a, another brother who was a solicitor, but doesn't practice anymore. And I have a sister who's a barrister. So I suppose... The nice thing is when you come to me, I have that wealth of experience, not just from me, uh, but from all my colleagues around. And from my own perspective, I started uh, my training in the big firms in Dublin and did a couple of years, did the hard slog before moving down to Tipperary. So I have a lot of colleagues as well. And to be honest with you, it's nice to have colleagues to bounce things off because the law is just so vast and no one can... Oh best to know it all and if they do I'd question that but so but yeah, but once you have everything uh you know on your at your doorstep to go and make it, it queries everything is there to be to be solved and uh to look further into it so and um, that's what I can give my clients it's fantastic Johanna well god almighty you've got an incredible experience and as you say it is in your genes it is in your DNA but um maybe I know we our whole focus is going to be around the, the conveyancing of buying and selling etc the process but maybe first you might just give us an idea of you know the the role because so many people just know there's so many different functions of this list or different roles and not many people know exactly what it entails but you know we really do need a solicitor at every stage in our lives I suppose throughout yeah. our lives so maybe you might just give us a brief synopsis Johanna. I will and, and actually I did uh, last year I did um, a presentation on a day in the life of a private client solicitor and what we do uh, and when you need uh, a solicitor and I suppose the first time usually clients come to me is when they're buying their first house uh, and you know they're they're perhaps you know on their own or they're with a partner I've just got recently got married so we get involved then and at that stage I always recommend making a will and people kind of look at me especially when they're young and they go why would you need to make a will and um, you know so once you have assets and then following that if you have children and what people kind of look at me and say well sure if I die everything goes to my surviving partner or spouse and they look after the children but what they tend to forget is what happens if both of them pass away together you know and if a will isn't there and um, appointing guardians for their children it can become very very messy so it's just a little bit of thought it's I know nobody likes to think about death but it's just it's better to do that the next stage, and actually what surprisingly, uh, I got feedback from a presentation I did recently that people didn't realize they needed a solicitor to remortgage. Um, the whole point on point. that is that the bank require a solicitor to certify title. 
So that's when it is required. So yes, uh, you know, for remortgaging, we're, we're involved then. So as the as as you know, you're trying to save a bit of money. Uh, it's always good. And I have a couple of clients that every two or three years will remortgage, and it's it's in their interest, and they free a bit of equity, uh, and it's nearly a business for them to remortgage all of the time. Um, it's not costly, Joanna. No, is it not costly? No, it's not too bad. And I just find that you know, without encouraging having to say to come back to me when you're familiar with the title anyway and familiar with their clients and they can give you an update um you know it is very cost effective i try and keep my fees down as much as possible but oh, there's no. yes. this registration fees and different things like that but generally without rule of thumb it comes in at about 1500 and i know that's everything vast uh registration fees and i know that the likes of ulster bank they they give a contribution of fifteen hundred uh, as part of their package, so it sort of ties in nicely there. I th and that, there's a reason for that figure, I think. So oh, then yeah. the next stage is, you know, Baba number two or three comes along, and you need to get a bigger house. So you sell your first house and you buy the next house, or perhaps you might build. So that's another area that we do. It's um, you know I have a lot of clients, especially from our Kells office, who would be building in the country, and um, they get a, a site maybe from a fam from their parents, and then they'll build. So there's a lot of planning issues, not planning issues. Mm -hmm planning regulations, building uh, building regulations as well, so certification. And just to emphasize, and I know we'll talk about it later, the main aim when you buy a property for your solicitor is to get a complete set of title documents, which not just includes proof of ownership, it includes your planning documents, and there's about another 19, so 20 in total of ancillary documents that prove your title and make sure it's 100% in order. So that's my job as a purchaser solicitor, and also as a vendor solicitor to produce that to the purchaser solicitors when you're selling. Uh, yeah. And then, so another area I do is employment. So again, along the life, or your life, you get a promotion in work. Uh, handy to have a quick you know your solicitor to have a quick look at that it, it's no harm it's money well spent it it only takes you your know contract, your employer's contract your employment yeah. contract yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly exactly just you know more often than not it's not up for negotiation but just that you know as an employee what you're signing at the end of the day because we're familiar with it and it's more so to know what to be protected against and what could happen down the line and again i act for clients in the wrc and labor court and actually only over the summer we did a virtual labor court hearing which was very interesting and it worked very very well so i have the benefit of seeing what can go wrong uh, and you know what 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 issues end up having to go to the wrc or the court so that's how i can input then on the contract of making sure that they're protected and as much as they can be so then, you know, if, if unfortunately you're in a road traffic accident or you um, get injured and the big point, uh, and I've spoken to you about this before, Claire, is that just because you get injured doesn't mean you make a claim. It has to be because somebody has been negligent and as a result of that negligence has caused that injury. So that's where, and we know the, 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 the Bailey, the swing incident, and it was interesting listening to her comment on that and she was very much, but I got injured. But, but you see what they got to, you know, who, who was negligent there? There was no negligence uh, as far as I can see from it, you know what I mean? But she yeah. was very much of the opinion, but I got injured, so I have a claim, and that is not the case. So I like to think I represent clients, you know, that get injured genuinely as a result of somebody else's negligence, as a result of which they have a claim. Okay. So that's your next thing. The other issue, I actually do an awful lot of medical and negligence as well. Um, it's an area that I, I got involved in a lot when I had a practice down in Tipperary. So if at the hands of a hospital or a doctor, there has been some negligence, the bar is very, very high, though, as regards proving negligence. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but a mm -hmm. recent one where an atopic pregnancy uh, wasn't spotted and should have been when scans were looked back on, it should have been seen um, as a result of which she was in two weeks in intensive care. Now, luckily for her, oh. she, you know, she she went on to have two more children. So the actual damages were contained because, you know, the consequences of of the, of the negligence wasn't too bad, but it still was bad. Yes. Yeah. 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 So then we go along a, a, another area and we go along and, uh, you know, unfortunately, if your marriage breaks down uh, and you need no. a family, 
law solicitor and um, so I do a good bit of that as well uh, you know it's, it's not there's no winners in that but it's just to uh, successfully dismantle your marriage in the best interests of the children and your assets so we try and do that and then the last one that I do having spoken about wills is I do uh, probate then administration okay. so it's very that, good wow this is, sure of all that I do in a day for clients uh, throughout all their lives yeah yeah that, that, that's a huge scope of work Joanna and I'm sure I'd say that keeps you incredibly busy my god it's incredible but I know your work ethic you're just you know your attention to detail is just fantastic and that's what really really and your communication that's what really you know you keep all clients informed and make sure to close out which is so so important so but now let's let's bring it back now I suppose to the um the buying and selling that's what our our actual our uh, listeners want to hear today so um really all but the buying and selling the, the your actual conveyancing process again not many people know what this it's completely misunderstood this term and it's like gobbledygook let's say a buyer might be you know they're going out to buy their first home you know they're they, or they're hell-bent on getting their first home but they don't really look look at what do i need before i do that and and similarly with the seller as well johanna you know um okay I'm putting my property down the market okay so uh, but again what what what's needed from a legal point of view, from your solicitor's point of view, you know, and, and so going about choosing your solicitor, but can you really, for a person, let's say, who's thinking about buying or selling in early 2021, please God, your tips and advice here would be really, really helpful if you could maybe bring us through that. And actually, Johanna, just before you start, I have a question here from the best of Dublin South, actually. And the question is, if an adjoining house has built an extension, do you need your solicitor to check planning or any other likely issues? I would recommend that. I mean, more often than not, they come to us afterwards because when they're doing an extension, I would hope well, the first person they usually go to is a builder. Yes. When really they should be going to an architect or engineering. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, and I'll just do a quick one because we'll probably cover it later on, is your title mm. documents. So if you do an extension and your builder will come in and say, well, it's exempt, you don't need anything. That's exempt from planning, but you actually need a certificate of exemption from an architect. Uh, okay. So you need to, yes. So you can go ahead and do that. Uh, the big thing with adjoining properties, and I think this is where your 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 the 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 the, the, the question relates is the adjoining properties and whether perhaps you need you know um, uh, consent of the adjoining landowner. If you have to get planning permission, of course, all your notices go up and they see, um, you know, what's going on and they can put in an objection. But normally I think people will chat to their neighbor beforehand and maybe just give them a heads up. And it's probably advisable to do that and just make sure that your boundaries are in order. Um, so, you know, my advice is, you know, you should be going to your solicitor and they'll be just what I'm saying here now. Your builder mightn't be sort of keeping you up to speed and know the title documents. The other big thing is the building regulations, which people think of planning and that's it. But the building regulations since 2014 have become extremely stringent and there's huge regulations there. And architects and engineers will not certify compliance retrospectively anymore. They will have to be there at the time. And again, it's to get your certificate of compliance with building regulations that you require to put with your title documents. And the problem for me as a solicitor, when I go to sell a property on behalf of clients and I say to them, did you do any works to the house? And they said, oh, yes, five years ago, we put on an extension, but the builder said it was exempt. And then you're going, oh, no, we don't have the mm. property documents and then it costs an awful yes. lot more for that to be done retrospectively if at all and your purchase price maybe have to be compromised and that's when you might have to reduce it by five thousand and that's when the problem comes so there's real consequences of not getting your title documents in order at the time and um, so yes yeah, i would you know just even a quick call to your solicitor pointing you in the right direction and um, you know if you're doing any works to the house and just get things as you go along in order so that when you ultimately go to sell everything is in order and there's no issues 
Excellent advice. Thank you, Johanna. I hope, um, I think that's Carmen, the best job said. Carmen, I hope that answers your question. I'm sure Johanna has answered that for you, hopefully. And I, I just should let everybody know, anybody joining us, I'm actually um, discussing here, talking a lovely chat with Johanna Lacey, principal of Johanna Lacey Solicitor. So if you have any questions, just feel free, just put them up there in the chat box on the right and we do our best to get around to them for you. So um, I just literally, I was just going to say about the, I'm so glad those planning regulations were brought in 2014, Joanna, because if you remember the awful disaster, my God, from, you know, pre the, the recession where there were there are now issues showing up a pyrite with, oh, it's just unbelievable. But that we can cover that maybe later. But as just coming back to bringing you back to the tips, like the pitfalls mm. to help people if they're putting the property in the market, they're selling their property. You might yeah, actually. Yeah, I'll start, I think, with, with, with selling a property first, because it then kind of leads nicely into the purchasing um, and, and, and uh, the, the tips then involved. But, you know, as a vendor, and I've, I've alluded to, you know, you bought your house 20 years ago and you've done various works and they're the ones that you just as a purchaser to list you go oh gosh you know how long is it since they and what's been done in the meantime you know it, you have to just be very very careful so the first thing you do as a, as a vendor solicitor you know I, I i i like to say to my auctioneer they come to me the minute they put the property on the market because the big issue if there's a mortgage on title your title documents, again, coming back to your title documents, will be with the bank. And the banks, they do things at their pace. And it usually takes about three to six weeks, depending on the bank. Um, you know, if it's Pepper, it could be six to eight weeks. Oh, it could take that long. We received. And that's where, it, you, know, you know, so when a vendor comes to me and it's you know we've just gone sale agreed and you go oh my gosh we're going to have to wait another three four weeks before we even get the title documents so the minute yes. you put the, the, the property on the market that's when you should be consulting your solicitor first uh, and you know and then you get your title documents now what i do say to clients because you know at that stage on receipt of the title documents i say to my clients do you want me to start reviewing them now and see what title documents need updating or missing what we have to do in order to present the contracts. Now, some clients I say to them, look, you know, would you prefer, because they don't know if their house is going to be sold and they don't want to start. Exactly. Exactly. So you try and balance it. So I say, look, let me know immediately. You think, you know, you've got a good feel that it's going to, you know, so you try and balance it like that, Claire, um, because you want to be fair to the client. And I suppose be fair to myself as well, because the minute I start working, you know, I, I need to get paid for my time as well. Of so, course, how would you time that? I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. But as long as your client knows what's involved, they can be informed and give you proper instructions at that time. So say, for instance, on one um, that I sold and is completing today, um, during the summer, um, the client uh, told me he was putting the house on the market. There was tenants in, the, in it, so we had to do um, a termination notice, and that went through yeah. smoothly. Um, mm -hmm. And then he said, look, title documents there, uh, you know, hold on them. Um, and then kind of towards the mid November, he told me, look, it's looking good. We're getting a few offers in, start looking at it now. So I started looking at it then in November, we issued contracts on the 7th of December. Uh, yes. Luckily cash buyer, all is oh good. Mm. Um, so issued 7th of December and we're closing today. So that's, that's an example of that it can be done and turned around quickly so there's no but that being said there was no bank involved there so number Absolutely. one you have the and number two was the cash buyer so i suppose yes. claire we've spoken about this before about you know why does it take so long and usually okay. you know it's the banks. If, if if a vendor solicitor hasn't been given enough warning to take up the title documents, there can be a delay there. And then as regards a purchaser and then as a vendor, you know, I have one vendor at the moment, they're selling and then they're buying and we can go no further on their purchase because we're still waiting to hear back from the vendor and they're waiting for their loan offer. So it affects no. sides all of the time. And typically, you know, clients come to me as purchasers and say I've loan approval in principle um, and then it can take four to six weeks at least to get the official loan offer. Because that's what a question I was going to ask you, Joanne, the difference between full loan approval and approval in principle. So it can take that length of time. So yeah. you can't get full loan approval until you have made your offer on a specific property has been accepted and then you go full steam ahead. And that's what I say to clients as purchasers, 
that's your job. You go off and get that sorted. I look after the rest of it, you know, um, okay. the legal side of it and doing all of that. And, you know, so, yeah, it can take that long. And that's not the end of it. So then you get loan approval and say, we lodge it then. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over to the purchaser side. But as a, yes, yeah, you're, you're, that, that's fine. Yeah. So as a purchaser, we then lodge the drawdown documents. And typically, you know, life insurance, ins the property insurance, that's our mortgage protection, our life insurance, as yeah. it's called. All of these things take time. And the problem with the bank, again, going back, they do things at their own pace. So typically they say, you know, they will look at them and review them within maybe 48 hours of receipt. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they have any queries, they give themselves another 48 hours in which to raise them. Suddenly that's a week gone by from, you know, that it could nearly be, you know, two weeks by the time you send them in, they get them, review them. Yeah. Back, and then, you know, suddenly you're into three, four weeks again. So you do the maths on it. That's where the, th you know, yeah, all that's where the delays. Yeah. And that's where any issues arising on the property even from a legal perspective that's just the bank side of things so going back to your vendor you know there's certain documents so my job as a vendor solicitor is to issue contracts with a complete set of title documents and the problem that i find as a purchaser solicitor is that they're not complete when you get them and you're doing all this chasing whereas if you can you know they're yeah they're very standard but we all know what they are you know what i mean so yeah yeah vendor solicitor to do a proper investigation and you know with their vendor client and make sure that they have all the necessary because then what happens is the purchaser engages a surveyor to go in and do an inspection yeah. and it is hoped that that surveyor will not spot something that the vendor and their solicitor doesn't already know do you know what i mean so yeah, you're just of course oh i can I mean, there before joanne i can tell you actually there's a question here just from hazel saying oh kai parents want a great interview um i have a friend looking to buy an apartment is there any difference between buying a house versus an apartment from a legal perspective yeah okay so i suppose when you're buying a house that could be all extensions and everything so from an apartment perspective there's not much that can be done as regards the apartment unit so usually there's no issues with that maybe maintenance and repair from your surveyor's point of view but my big ask of the surveyor is in relation to the common areas and that's the big thing so you have management companies and um, mm -hmm. that manage uh, the common areas and they make sure that they're okay and the big thing is on those, and alluding again to the 2014 regulations and pyrite and everything, I'd say half the apartments that I'm selling or buying, there are building regulation issues, fire safety certificate issues, as a result of which uh, works need to be done to the whole apartment block. And yeah. the costs of those works are borne by the apartment owners and a levy is then charged. So as a solicitor, uh, purchaser solicitor of an apartment, my job is to review, they're called the MUD uh, requisitions, the multi-unit development requisitions. There's a whole set of them, a couple of pages, and we get replies to them uh, from the vendors and the management agency. And we scrutinize those and make sure, our big job is to make sure if there's any future levies that we should, you sure. know, align to. And I think, you know, an example of one um, that I had last year, where I was selling an apartment. And to be honest with you, as a vendor solicitor, we don't really look at those replies. So it's not up to us to investigate and sure. to see if there are any issues. So you pass them on to the purchaser solicitor. If they have any issues with them, they raise them and we pass them back to the management agents. Um, and on the sale of my apartment, uh, there was no issues and we closed fairly quickly and everyone was happy. About six months later, I bought an apartment in that unit for, client, uh, for a client. And of course I was on the other side of things. So when the mud replies, yeah were received I reviewed them and there were issues yes and, yeah. and, and levies anticipated oh they could be quantified and we ended up getting 10,000 euros off the purchase price for the client because of those so I suppose that's just emphasizing the importance of reviewing them carefully and making sure you know and you also rely on your client surveyor who will go on and he's the eyes and he'll go around and look and he'll say you see the state of the common areas you know okay. and he'll give tips or if there's a balcony or you know that the, the, the should be works done so it's twofold there so it's very important very very important with apartments
Yeah, because actually I myself experienced that, Johanna, even with two sales up in not too far away, up in Sandiford and fire safety issues. So we had to give the buyers both a reduction in uh, price. So it was the only way around it. And as you say, the cost is borne by the, the whole the manager company, the, the apartment owners themselves. But Carmen, I hope, or sorry, Hazel, that was your question. I hope that answered your question. OK, Hazel. And I see there's another one from Siobhan, but I'm just going to actually, Johanna, um, let me see. Um, again, I know you've covered that really because I know in the States, I'm a member of NAR in um, the National Association of Realtors in the US and they close the sale in 48 hours and they just cannot understand why it takes up to six months over here. But so maybe I know now, again, just for anybody joining us, Johanna Lacey here, Johanna Lacey, uh, principal of Johanna Lacey Solicitors. If you have any questions, please just put them up there in the, the top right hand, hand corner. So we, we don't have too much more time, Johanna, but um, just literally, I suppose, Again, as I say, my clients say, you know, why does it take so long? Why can't we shorten the process? So with COVID, let's say, for instance, I had to transform the business, like never realizing I'd be doing a Facebook Live here in 2020, Joanna, but I had to move everything online. So all my documents are now e-signed, signed electronically, and we try and limit the physical interaction between, you know, potential buyers, sellers as much as we can for viewers for letting. I know it's not easy, but... Um, I suppose it can, it can, the, can all the conveyancing documents now be signed online or? Most of them uh, can be done online. So for instance, and this is one I'm involved with, with you, Claire, uh, where we, where I have a client who lives in Dubai and selling an apartment right. um, at the moment. And uh, we got, I emailed him the documents over the weekend. Uh, I did a, a Zoom call with them on Monday morning, witnessed him signing all of the documents, uh, which under the um, e-commerce act is allowed. I can do it over 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 video, uh, and he put them in DHL. I, I received the documents from Dubai on Wednesday morning, and we're closing the sale today. Yeah, absolutely. And one where we sent out the contracts at the start of December, and uh, there is a mortgage involved with that one, uh, and the purchaser solicitor has got that all. I'm just waiting; he's he's expecting funds today, so hopefully we'll get that one over the line as well. But having had a practice down in Tipperary, and also having my practice in Kells, I do an awful lot remotely. So, for instance, a Tipperary client uh, selling a site in uh, in my glass in Tipperary today did all of it online. Um, got all everything signed and we're closing that one today as well. So all around the country, um, selling a, a closing a purchase in Wicklow today as well. So it doesn't matter really where you, you can be anywhere. Uh, so the clients, yeah, yes, we can offer that service. Yeah, the only thing is, uh, again, the banks. Uh, I get clients in to, 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 to sign the bank documents because it's just it, it, I, I, I don't want to take any issue or anything with those. To be honest with you, yeah. Okay. Okay. And could that change in the future, Joanna? Could that ever go online, or, or do we? Yeah, we all can. If, you know, if, if you really needed to do them online, we can do them. But you know, I prefer to get clients in to do them, and they will come in for for mortgages and stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll get there, though. I think. Yeah. Absolutely. So maybe just one last little area is again. I know our listeners will want to know really about you know, how can we shorten the whole conveyancing process here, make it more streamlined going from sale agreed. It's, I think it's fine getting to your sale agreed stage. If you've got a fantastic property, you, you've got your right price, but it's sale agreed to sold. How can we shorten that, let's say, or do you know of any new trends, maybe future trends, Joanna? That yeah, there, there is, and it, it's a trend that I do anyway, but there are um, kind of online platforms now. And as you said there at the, at the introduction, it's about keeping all of the stakeholders involved in the process updated and finding solutions. You know, yes. all too often, you know, people are looking for problems, but if a problem is identified, you immediately look for a solution and you get it over the line. So that's one of my, I would hope, forties. I, I believe in that I'm a solution. Yeah. And you keep everyone informed. There's none of this cloak and dagger stuff of people chasing, going, where are we at? Have pre-contract queries been replied to? Who has the loan offer? You know, as long as everyone knows what's happening and we can keep things moving. And there is ways, I mean, you know, even with mortgages involved, you know, I had one, there was problems and convey uh, the surveyor, but we got them sorted. And literally within the last 10 days, we've gotten drawdown of a mortgage just by chasing. Uh, so there is there there is ways of doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's really good to know, Johanna. I got some amazing nuggets there and I really hope that was helpful for all our listeners. There's just one last, uh, jo or Siobhan has just asked a question here. 
Oh, yeah. Is it true that sometime next year house sales would close faster than currently is the case, which is slow? Well, in actual fact, Siobhan, that's just literally what we were talking about there. It is slow. It is slow. And I, I think, I think, Johanna, there is a lot of apps that are being developed now to try and, yeah. if you like, bring all parties, you know, the solicitors, the estate agents, bring them all together to try and, and shorten this process. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, yes, Siobhan, it's definitely in the pipeline, that's for sure. And yeah. I only hope yeah. Yeah. yeah, the basis of those, Claire, are, of those platforms are to keep everyone informed. And I'm involved in a few of them, um, you know, and, and they, they, they are very good. But, you know, email is a great thing. Copy everyone. I blind copy my clients on, on, on things so that they can just see what's yes, going on. I think that's a fantastic yeah. idea. Yeah, you're keeping yeah. everybody in the loop full transparency and it just takes away the oh god who's doing what you know uh, what's happening here or why come this it just because the lack of communication is the is the worst for any client that's when they say i haven't heard back from my sister or look now where's the estate agent and it's the communication is key as you say keeping everybody in the loop it's just fantastic well, ultimately claire everyone involved wants the thing done as quick as possible so it's a no-brainer really you know uh, people want to get out of their sold their property into the property we want to do the work quickly and efficiently and get paid at the end of it as do the auctioneers i don't mean to i mean no, but I know. therefore so it's in everyone's interest to get it over the line you know and that's my I mean, I, I think people get annoyed at me chasing them, but your luck, we, we... Oh, no, I think you're definitely doing the right thing. You're definitely doing the right thing, Johanna. And Vaughan Fitzpatrick, there's a lovely little um, note there to say, fantastic notes of advice and information here, Claire Connie, Joanna Lacey. Thank you. And thank you for that, Siobhan. We're very much appreciated. So, Johanna, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. You've been so good today to give up your time to join us on All Under One Roof. So, and if anybody has any... Um, uh, is there any other... Okay, no, yeah, I know we probably won't get time really to have any more questions, Joanna. But if anybody needs to talk to you or have a consultation with you, um, can you tell me, Joanna, where is the best? Where is the, can they find out more information? I'm a bit of an email queen, I have to say. So the best way, in fairness, to, is to email me at Johanna. That's J O H A N N A at J L A C J L A C Y dot I E. So pop me an email. That's the best way I'll get back to you because you know, in my time, I can get back to you. So um, no problem. Delighted to deal with any queries and uh, you know, make this process quicker and get everyone happier. Yeah. Amen. Gosh, and Joanna. Thank you so much, Joanna. I really do appreciate it. I say again for giving your time. Hope you have a fabulous Christmas. And to all our listeners, thank you for tuning in and thank you for your questions. And I really hope that you all have a very, very safe and happy Christmas. And God, please, God, we'll have a really, really good 2021. So looking forward to seeing you all then. Thanks, Johanna. Take care. Yeah. All the best. Happy Christmas. And you too, Johanna. All the best. Bye.